Yeah, I'm officially shaking. This NFL trade deadline's been the craziest shit I've seen since... Actually, I saw some crazy shit in Austin this weekend, but you get the point. This is one of the crazier trade deadlines. Probably, in, it's probably the craziest trade, trade deadline in history. At least social media makes it seem that way. And you know your boy had to hop in there, right? I woke up looking like Mr. Krabs this morning. I didn't know what was going on. I see all this trade deadline new Jimmy Garoppolo to the 49ers, JHI to the Eagles. We got Zeke suspension back upheld. I'm sure it's an NFL conspiracy theory. They were waiting for all this knowledge bombs to drop so they could be like, yeah, we win the suspension. No one's going to get too angry about it. Nothing like that. Dwayne Brown goes over to Seattle. Right now, it is 1.15 p.m. Eastern time. The trade deadline is officially closed at 4 p.m., but I wanted to get this video out to you guys because it's going to take me a little while to edit and get out, whatever. It's also Tuesday, meaning my waiver wire sheet drops today as well as my murky running back situation sheet. So if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, make sure that you go to my site, bdgeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, put your info in, and you'll get an email every time my blog posts come out as well as random videos like this. So I want to go over the the trades that have happened in the NFL so far this morning, what happens in the fantasy football landscape, right? What do all these trades affect? So go follow me on Twitter also if you're not following me on Twitter, but I don't want to uh, take any more time because I know I got a lot of breakdown in these videos, so I want to get right into it. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through, very quick analysis, my breakdown, a lot of numbers, a lot of facts, stats, all that kind of stuff. You guys could choose to do with it what you would like. The first move that we saw kind of come through was Jimmy Garoppolo going to the 49ers. I know it's kind of shook the earth, right? Now Tom Brady has no backup. This means that the Patriots are expecting Tom Brady to play until he's like 58 years old. Wouldn't surprise me. So Jimmy Garoppolo goes to the 49ers. Kyle Shanahan gets his quarterback for the future. Maybe, supposedly, Kirk Cousins maybe is stuck with the Redskins. At least that's one less destination that he could head to. What does this mean, right? Garoppolo comes to the 49ers. Patriots get a uh, second-round pick in 2018, which will be a very high pick because the Niners are not going to end up with a good record. What we know about Garoppolo is that he will not be active for Week 9. They've already announced that. C.J. Bethard will still be, or Bethard, however you say it, will still be the starter there in the 49ers uniform for the very, very, very foreseeable future. Now, the other thing I want to take away is before people hop on him and, you know, go to run and pick him up and spend a lot of fab budget on him is that he's moving to this Kyle Shanahan offense, right? And this is no doubt a long-term move, right? They see him as the quarterback of the future. Kyle Shanahan's playbook is very, 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 very complex. Remember when he came over to the Falcons last year, Matt Ryan and them struggled for the first year. And Matt Ryan even came out in the, in the offseason following that first year and was like, the playbook was a lot. It was very complex. It was hard to learn. You know, we didn't have everything down packed, but then he got familiar with it over the course of the first offseason with Shanahan and into the second year. And that's when we really, really, really saw that Falcons offense blow up last year, right? Leading the, the NFL in points per game and all that stuff. Matt Ryan with this career year. So Grop is already out for week nine. They play, I believe it's the uh, Giants. Yeah, Giants in week 10. After the Giants game, they have a bye in week 11. So they might throw him into the fire in week 10 against the G-men, or if they if they decide to sit him out for um, both the Cardinals game and then the Giants game, they get that bye. So he'll have three full weeks kind of going over the playbook and getting situated within this offense. I think that would be the smarter move because it's not like they need to get him in there to try to win games this year. Um, but we'll see what happens there. He could be coming back at week 12. What I will say is even, you know, when he's thrown into the fire, like I said, it's a complex playbook, so he's not going to have, like, this full offense at his disposal. In my opinion, I don't think he's going to pick it up that quickly. Um, so it's going to be a little difficult for him. What we do know is, you know, last year when Tom Brady had the suspension, Garoppolo started for two of the games. He went 42 for 60 overall, 498 passing yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. He had an 8.4 yards per attempt uh, number, right? And Brian Hoyer this year in the six in the six games that he started was at 5.6. So that's a huge upgrade in terms of the passing. Of course, it goes around to the team, the production as a whole, way better weapons, just an overall better system. And what I wanted to do was kind of look at where he was throwing the ball, right? Because when he comes over to the 49ers, how does that impact, you know, George Kittle, Pierre Garcon, Marquise Goodwin, uh, Carlos Hyde, Matt Breida, things like that. And I was looking at the target numbers for the two games that Garoppolo was at the quarterback position. 
Edelman led the team by far with 17 targets over those two games. Martellus Bennett was second with 10 targets. Chris Hogan and James White both had nine. Amendola and Mitchell had eight um, and seven, respectively. So he's spreading the ball around, right? And that's obviously a product of uh, the New England system that we've seen Brady dominate over um, the few years. But I, I'm not sure it's really going to have a huge fantasy impact on anyone on the 49ers. And I think the only guy that's really safe to play at this point is probably Carlos Hyde outside of Pierre Garcon and good PPR matchups. Um, so when he comes, right, he, he relied on Edelman a lot. He relied on even Martellus Bennett. So it could be a good thing for George Kittle. You know, when you're getting into this newer offense, you need um, these playmakers that will be there for you can kind of be your safety valve. I'm not really sure it's a big change for this offense in terms of fantasy purposes. It's definitely way more of an exciting move in real life NFL. Like if I'm a 49ers fan, I'm pumped up because you had no idea where your team was going or if you're going to be able to draft a quarterback or if you even like like Sam Darnold. Like I think that's that would be a big bust move if, if they drafted him. Um, but, you know, if, if they come back in, if they wait after the bye week 11, so they start off week 12 and they can get six games out of uh, Garoppolo to end the season, right? Seattle at Chicago at Houston, Tennessee, Jacksonville at the Rams. Per PFF, Mike Castiglione. It's also worth noting that the that three of the 49ers' final four opponents through the fantasy playoffs are currently ranked inside the top six in PFF pass coverage grade. Just to kind of get back to a fantasy perspective on things, yeah, he should definitely be added in two quarterback leagues. It's very hard to pick up someone throughout the year that could give you production, uh, especially heading into the playoffs. So, in terms of how much, check out my waiver wire piece that I've emailed out to you. And if you're not on the newsletter, just check my website out. I have my waiver wire piece in which I kind of talk about would you use the number one waiver wire? Um, how much fab would you spend on the guy? So check that out. But I, I, yeah, you're definitely going after him in two quarterback leagues. If you're in a one quarterback league, I'm staying away from him. I just don't think that things kind of add up as uh, some people might kind of hop onto that train more quickly than they should, right? Without kind of getting a breakdown or analysis. So that's my thoughts on Jimmy G. And uh, I want to move over to the big one, of course, and that's Jay Ajayi getting traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. This is one that I'm, I'm wrestling with, right? When you look at it from a bird's eye point of view, you're just like, oh, wow, huge, 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 huge move, right? Jay Ajayi, feature back, takes over, and everyone's initial thoughts are, wow, much better line, much better team, much better offense. Jay Ajayi is an RB1 going forward without a doubt. I'm not sure that he's even better than LeGarrette Blunt at this point. I'm serious when I say that. If you've watched the games, Blunt's been inconsistent, right? He's not really getting a lot of volume, so it's hard to get rolling. But in the games he has gotten volume, he's looked very good. Jay Ajayi, on the other hand, I know that that Miami offense sucks, right? I know the offensive line blows. I understand the situation there. But if you've watched him run, I've watched a lot of it. I've gone back on Game Pass and watched a lot of his runs. He is not hitting the hole like an NFL running back should. I know there's not a lot there, but when he does find one, he's getting tackled by... Uh, a lot of one arm, one arm tacklers. Uh, his yards after contact number is good, but when I watch him, man, he just doesn't have that explosion. He doesn't run mean like Legarrette Blunt does. So, my opinion, I'm not sure he's actually that much better than Legarrette Blunt at this point. Um, listen, he was traded for a fourth round pick. This is not a blockbuster. The only reason it's super, super hyped up is because fantasy football. Fantasy football is basically just as big as the NFL is nowadays, right? It's probably even bigger, or will be in a couple years. So, J.H.I., everyone knows, is a first, second round pick. Getting moved to a new offense is going to be huge news. Again, it's a fourth round pick, though. So, clearly not a blockbuster. I think it's one of those things where, you know, they would like a more consistent running game altogether and not have to rely on Blunt and then some random, either Corey Clement or Wendell Smallwood. So, this definitely rounds out their running back core. I think it might be more of like a you know, we didn't have to give that much up. You realize, like, I think teams are starting to realize that that these these draft picks that they have, right? Like, a fourth round pick is not gold. For the most part, you're missing on your draft picks. Not all these guys turn into studs. Some of them play key roles. That's only because there's not enough good players to go around. So I think they're realizing, like, give up a fourth round pick for a running back that could solidify this seven and one team, and you're looking at you know a good offense. But in terms of fantasy, I feel like this is kind of just throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Um, all right, so I actually heard another interesting theory, too, is trading um, trading for a Jai was a way of kind of cop blocking Jerry Jones, which would be interesting, obviously, because they're in the division. Because I feel like Jerry Jones, with, with the Zeke suspension, which we'll talk about in a minute, would definitely have given up a fourth-round pick to get Jay Ajayi to close out these, these six games, you know? Um, so, anyways, 
what we're looking at for Legarrett, I mean, uh, JHI, ranks 20th in elusive rating among uh, starting running backs. He's forced just 23 missed tackles after seven games while averaging 2.77 yards after contact, after contact, which is ranked 16th among running backs per PFF, Zoltan, Zoltan, Boudet. Blunt, on the other hand, has been very, 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 very good, averaging 4.7 yards per carry this season, NFL best 2.9 yards after initial contact, minimum 80 carries. Blunt is first in the NFL in elusive rating, second in yards after contact, and third in tackles avoided. So, wow, Blunt is not getting the workload. He has been very, very efficient, and there's no way that they're just going to push him off, and there's no way they're just going to, um, you know, phase him out of the backfield. This does leave five running backs on the Eagles roster, right? It leaves Jay Ajayi, LeGarrette Blunt, Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood, Kenyon Barner. Barner plays a lot of special teams, so if they want to keep five guys on the roster, I feel like that'd be kind of weird, but if they don't, it's very possible that they come out and cut Corey Clement, even though he's been like a decent piece of this uh, this offense. I think him and, him and um, Wendell Smallwood are kind of uh, redundant now in terms of having Ajayi and Blunt. So that, that's something to just kind of keep an eye on with. And uh, obviously the big discrepancy here is the offensive lines and the offense as a whole. Now, JJ is moving from Pro Football Focus's 30th graded run blocking team to the 7th graded from Miami to Philly. What's interesting to me is I was looking at Football Outsiders. And obviously these things are graded very differently. They're ranked differently. But Football Outsiders have... The Eagles ranked as the 21st best run blocking line, Miami as the 28th, so it's a lot less of a discrepancy. And you also now have Jason Peters, who is out for the entire season, for the rest of the year, and he was the number three overall rated tackle by Pro Football Focus out of like 80 tackles. So that line, according to Football Outsiders, was not amazing to begin with, and now they're losing one of the best linemen in the game. Um, I also want to say, here's a really good tweet I'll put on the screen from Graham Barfield. The max amount of touches an Eagles running back has received under Doug Peterson in 24 games is 22. And obviously, you know, Jay Jai has done that more than a few times this year as well as last year. Uh, just four times has an R running back gotten 20 plus touches. Peterson favors running back by committees. Phillies in the top half carries inside the 10 with 13. Miami is last with four. So what he's saying is basically Peterson likes to use a running back by committee. I do also think that that stat is kind of skewed just by the personnel that they've had over the last couple of years. They've had a lot of injuries, right? They have guys like Sproles who are specialty. Um, Ryan Matthews was kind of the guy last year, was in and out of being injured. So I don't. they never really had a feature back, so it, it's kind of hard to put a price on, on that tweet and see if there's any kind of boost behind it. But I would say, you know, he's definitely going to use a committee. It's not going to be J.J. getting 20, 25 carries a game. Um, and when you look at, you know, the usage inside the uh, five-yard line or, or by the goal line, this is where I think Ajayi can kind of capitalize as well as on third down. Per pro football reference, Blunt is third in the NFL with eight rushes inside the five-yard line this year. He has eight goal line opportunities. He's only converted one of them into touchdowns. Per pro football reference, Ajayi doesn't have a single attempt inside the five-yard line this year. When we look back at last year, J.J. had seven rushes inside the five-yard line, and he converted five of them. So five for seven is very, very, very good. And we know Blunt has success there. He's one for eight on this year. Um, but I was reading some other stats that their line is getting killed when they're in the red zone or when they're on the goal line. They're, they're letting guys come into the backfield and contact them super early. Um, we saw Blunt have a ton of success last year in New England, but I think that's somewhere that they might use a Jai, right? They might look and turn to him um, near the goal line rather than Blunt. And then we look at like passing work, right? On the on the year, JJ has just 14 receptions through seven games. Blunt has just four. So we'll have to see what they do with the running back situation. If they get rid of Clement, that would be a big boost to Ajayi on third downs, I think. It, it's possible that they let Ajayi kind of take over this pass catching role in this offense. He proved he could do it in college, right? You look back at his last year at Boise State, he caught 50 balls for 535 yards and four touchdowns. So he's very, very, very capable of catching the ball. He just hasn't been able to translate that into the NFL. He's averaging just, I think, like 6.3 yards per reception on his in his career. Um, and that ranks him, you know, very, very low in terms of yards per reception for running backs. And his catch percentage in terms of, like, catching the ball and, and the amount of targets he's gotten has been, like, outside of the top 40 running backs 
both this year and last year. So he's not great at the pass catching role, but he's definitely better than Blunt, and he's possibly just as good as like a Corey Clement and a, and a Wendell Smallwood. The, the other thing that's huge to take away from here, and probably the most underrated piece of you know what you won't see in fantasy football analysis, is Jay automatically becomes the best pass blocking running back in this backfield. That means he is going to stay on the field for third downs. And he's going to be seeing a lot more snaps because of that, which means he will be getting more involved. It's very good for goal line. It's very good for uh, short yardage plays. It's very good for passing down. So the fact that he's a pass blocker is huge because they just lost Jason Peters, like I said, to kind of protect Carson Wentz's backside. They need a guy who can step in and block, and that's not anyone on the Philadelphia's running back roster strong point. So that's a big that's a big piece for J.H.I.E. Um, so really the question comes down to this is, do you think the increase in terms of efficiency, right? Like the team, uh, the offensive line and, and the possible goal line opportunities outweighs the dip in volume that's coming for Ajayi, right? Ajayi's had a few games this year with over like 20, 25 carries. So he couldn't get it really done there in terms of fantasy perspective. Those numbers are definitely going to dip, right? Sharing the backfield, but will the efficiency increase? That's the main question you got to ask yourself. You know, Philly is fourth in the NFL in terms of scoring. They're averaging 29 points per game. Miami is dead last, averaging just over 13 points per game. So that is a huge swing in terms of offensive efficiency. Philly's also averaging the fourth most rushing attempts per game. They're almost at 31 rush attempts per game. So there definitely is a lot of work to go around here, even if it's, you know, 15 for Ajayi, 8 for uh, Blunt, and then like, uh, seven split between Smallwood and Barner, which is definitely something we could see. Uh, Miami was 22nd in the NFL, averaging just 24 rushing attempts per game. Like I said, it, it looks really good from a bird's eye view. I still am hesitant only because I just think Blunt is a, still a very good runner and he's given them uh, more than a, enough of a look this year that can, you know, that the coaches know what Blunt's capable of and he can definitely get it going. Um, I, you know, he's been inconsistent, so it's very possible that they kind of let the hot hand ride. If Blunt's starting off the game and he's starting off very weak, they might just turn right to Ajayi and give him a featured workload. But if Blunt gets in there, you know, and rips off a few like 11, 15, 17 yard gains, I see no way that Ajayi is just going to come in there and, you know, get 20 carries a game. So it, it's, it, I'm saying like, I, I, of course I like the move for Ajayi, but I'm hesitant to just say he's a top 12 back going forward in this offense. Um... Their schedule, you know, okay, so next week they play Denver, the toughest fantasy running back matchup in the NFL. Then they get a bye, so that's base. I'm not going to say it's unusable for Ajayi in week nine, but that's two, you're, obviously you can't use him in the bye, but that's another, that's two weeks that, that he's probably not going to be in your lineup. Uh, then they get the Bears, who are averaging 3.9 yards per carry against opposing runners, and then Seattle, Rams, Giants, all away teams, but they haven't been good. All three of those teams are have been pretty poor against the run this year. Um, and then they get a Raiders team in week 16. So it should be very interesting to see how this turns out. And I'm kind of, uh, I'm on the fence about Ajayi. Like, should you move for him? Should you move him away? I would say I'm definitely not trying to trade him. Um, like, if he's on my roster, I'm not getting rid of him until I see what they're doing, which which I guess could be costly because you might not see much against Denver, and then he's got a bye, so you might have to wait a few weeks to see what's going on. But I would say um, if you could buy if you could buy him for wide receiver two value or something, I would, I would go for that because he could end up being uh, seeing a very big workload down the stretch and, and being someone that can kind of carry you into the playoffs and through the playoffs. But again, like the eye test for me, I, I don't really see it from a Jai. I don't see that explosion. I don't see anything that's going to be like that puts that really puts him a, a step ahead of Blunt. So I don't know. That's that's kind of my thoughts. on. Let me know your thoughts on a Jai. Like, do you would do you see him? Um, I, give me this over under. Would you say from from this point forward, does a Jai finish as a top 15 running back? We'll say half PPR. You think he finishes better than that? You think he finishes worse than that? Um, going forward, I'm going to say, I think he finishes right outside that. I would say he's like RB 16 to 18 in that range. So I'll go the over on that one. And of course him moving out of Miami leaves a void in Miami, right? They have to give the ball to someone that leaves two guys. Well, actually that leaves three guys. If you include this guy, Sonora, Sonora's, Sonora's Penny, Sonora's Penny. I don't know. That's a, that's a third string running back 
who I'm sure somehow will win the, the, the starting job and end up running away with fantasy leagues because that's just how fantasy football works. But realistically, what we're looking at from a real analysis is Kenyon Drake and Damian Williams. You have Kenyon Drake, he's 6'1", 210, third round pick out of Alabama. Adam Gase was the one who drafted him. Gase came out earlier this month before Ajayi was even traded and said that uh, Drake was the number two running back on this team. So you can count on that. You could count on him being the early down guy there. Uh, and you look at this last game that they had where they just got their asses whooped by Baltimore, 40 to nothing. Drake was the only guy who actually got a, uh, got a carry outside of Ajayi. He had six carries for 22. Um, Drake has four, four, five, 40 yard speed. So good speed, good build, decent athletic profile coming out of Alabama. He played all four years at Alabama. He never had more than 92 carries in a season. And again, he played all four years. So you don't have a big workload to go off of. You don't have a big sample size to go off of in terms of him carrying the ball. There's always better running backs at Alabama. Obviously, they have this long lineage of, of beast backs, and Kenyon Drake was not one of those guys. So um, his senior year, he caught 29 balls for 276 yards. So he's definitely capable of catching the ball. Uh, but Damian Williams is definitely better suited for the pass catching role here. And last year, uh, Kenyon Drake did not have a single carry inside the five-yard line for the Dolphins as per pro football reference. So, Drake is probably the early down guy. I'm not sure he's going to see much passing down work. I'm not sure he's going to see many goal line carries. Not that they really have any carries because, like I said before, Ajayi didn't have any carries inside the five on the year. So, uh, not tons of upside here with Drake. Damian Williams is the other guy. 5'11", 225 from Oklahoma. Undrafted free agent, 25 years old. Career 3.4 yards per carry guy. Same speed as Drake, right? 4, 4, 5, 40. When it becomes interesting is the when, when I just said the weak points for Drake were his pass catching role and goal line duties. Uh, Williams, over the last three years, he's been in the league for three years prior to this year. He had 21 catches, 21 catches, and 23 catches. 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, and, he, and he scored three receiving touchdowns last year. He had six total touchdowns. And he had six goal line carries, so six carries inside the five-yard line. So he's getting a lot of pass-catching work. He's seeing goal line carries, and he converted two of them um, for touchdowns last year. And Drake had zero. So what I'd say is, you know, neither of them has gotten really any play time this year. Williams has 12 carries for 35 yards. Drake has 10 carries for 25 yards on the year. Williams separates himself in PPR leagues because of the receiving work. And if there's any goal line opportunity available, it'll probably go to him. Like I said, 5'11", 225. So he's a big back, right? He's kind of like a bulldozer kind of guy. Um, so he might get those. When you look at the passing work, Williams has eight catches for 50 yards compared to just Drake's three catches on five targets for seven yards. So unless they go out and sign another running back, I'm saying it's a full running back by committee. Drake will see the early down work. Williams will be catching the ball and probably getting most of the goal line opportunities if there are any. Again, this is a really bad offensive line, a really bad offense, especially if they end up moving Jarvis Landry, which there are a lot of rumors and reports for. Um, and they're scoring 13 points a game. So I'm not getting too excited about either of them. I would definitely, um, Drake is probably the guy I prefer having. Uh, if I had to choose one of the two in either format, it would be Drake. I'm not blowing fab money on them. I'm not blowing a lot of fab money on them, I should clarify. I would let someone else overspend on both guys here. And the other actual tangible trade we have in our hands is Dwayne Brown, the tackle for the Texans. It's time for him to get out of there. He didn't want to play with them. He was holding out. He played his first game this last Sunday against uh, Seattle in that shootout, probably the best game of the year. He was traded to that team, to the Seattle Seahawks, for Jeremy Lane, their cornerback, a fifth-round pick in 2018, and a second-round pick in 2019. This is a huge boost for the Seattle Seahawks line, uh, mainly because they're literally, like, here, so any lineman would be a boost for them. According to Pro Football Focus, Seattle was ranked 29th in pass blocking, and they were the 27th overall offensive line. Per Football Outsiders, it actually had them graded a little higher. They were 25th in the run, but actually 19th in pass. Overall, it's a big upgrade either way, right? Because here's who he's replacing. Reese, uh, I don't even know how to say the last name. I probably should because I feel like people say it all the time just because they know how bad he is. Reese Adiambo, he was literally the lowest graded tackle um, per Pro Football Focus in the entire league. It was like 78 tackles, left tackle, right tackle, the lowest graded tackle. Disgusting. So he gets replaced by uh, Dwayne Brown, also per PFF. On 428 pass block snaps in 2016, Brown let up a single sack on his way to putting up his eighth consecutive season being ranked inside the top 20 at his position. Pro, per football 
<laughs> Purple football, poopy focus. Obviously, it's not great for Houston, right? They lose this, this lineman, but that was the first game he's played in, so it's not like Watson and this offense haven't done it without him. Um, so I don't think much changes there for Houston. Again, big upgrade for Seattle uh, in the run game, in the pass game overall. So it's going to be interesting to see how they... Uh, how they play going forward. And, you know, you're replacing the worst tackle with a very good tackle. So I'm excited to see what Russell Wilson can do. And lastly, we have to talk about, obviously, the Zeke suspension. Not trade deadline, but this is uh, this is interesting nonetheless because it's back on, I think, supposedly. And it seems like it's going to be sticking for good this time. I have never came out and actually said that. I always say that I'll believe it when I see it. This time it looks like this the, it will be sticking for good. So he'll be out for the next six weeks. Jerry Jones has already come out and said, oh, wait, breaking news, Roto World says that Eagles VP of Football Operations, Harry Roseman, said LeGarrette Blount remains the team's starting running back even after acquiring J.J. for the Dolphins on Tuesday. Hey, what do you say? That kind of confirms what I said, that they still believe in LeGarrette Blount. That could just be for like week nine while J.J. kind of um, gets into the swing of things and learns the playbook and things like that. Then they have the bye, so he should be fully equipped following that. So for now, I'm not really sure you can play J.H.I. Obviously, it's early in the week, so we'll hear more reports coming through. Anyways, back to Zeke. Jerry Jones came out and said Alfred Morris is the running back one right now. This is confirmed by a report that came out from O.C. Scott Linehan saying that they've been preparing Alfred Morris to be that running back one role in the case that Zeke's suspension sticks, which it does. Um, but there's also reports that obviously McFadden, who has been a healthy scratch for every game so far this season, and Rod Smith will factor in. And I think that's most definitely what's going to happen. They're going to form a, a running back by committee. Um, but, you know, Jerry Jones likes Darren McFadden. Obviously, they've used him in that workhorse role before, so they know he could do it. He could play all three downs. He's, I'm not saying he's good at all three downs, but he's equipped to play all three downs as opposed to Morris, who has like cinder blocks on his fists when he's trying to catch the ball. Um, on the season so far, neither back, none of the backs have really gotten any work. Morris has outcarried Rod Smith 13 to 10, outrushed him 105 to 69. They both have a ridiculously high yards per carry, 8.1 and 6.9, but Alfred Morris had like a 70 yard run back in week four. That's obviously inflated all of his numbers. Um, he's been, he looked really good in the preseason. They had a, a few uh, chances that they gave him to kind of run the rock and he looked good. You know, we've obviously seen Morris had success in the NFL before this. Um, but that was years ago. That was with RG3. That was, you know, there. there it was different times. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times for my boy Alf. Um, last year for the Cowboys, Morris had 69 carries uh, and averaged. That, that's a full send right there. Averaging 3.5 yards per carry on the year. So not great behind a, a even better offensive line than they have this year. Over the next six games, the Cowboys get Kansas City, Atlanta, Philadelphia, the Chargers, Washington, New York, Giants, before Zeke will return against Oakland in week 15, right? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, yeah, 15. Okay, so uh, none of these matchups are ones you really necessarily are like shying away from or terribly scared of. Uh, but the Dallas offensive line has certainly kind of come into its own and it's improved. There was a lot of talk this offseason about them losing two starting pieces. And they started off a little shaky. You know, Zeke and the offensive line as a whole started off a little shaky. But they are currently ranked sixth in the NFL in uh, as a run blocking unit and third in pass blocking per football outsider. So they're kind of back to their top five um, eliteness in terms of offensive line. Overall, this is what I have to say about the situation. I would straight up be lying to you if I said I knew what was going to happen. If uh, I don't do that to big dog country, right? I'm not going to lie to you guys. I just kind of give you my analysis and give you my thoughts. Here's what I'll be doing. I will gladly put in a waiver on all three guys in all of my leagues. Alfred Morris would definitely be my first priority. DMC will be my second. Rod Smith will be my third. That's regardless of format. That's regardless of PPR standard, 38 points per carry, whatever it may be. My, my advice is probably going to be let someone else blow their fab budget on these guys uh, and take the cheapest of the three if possible. I will definitely be targeting Alfred Morris as my top guy in, um, in any of the leagues that I can you know blow fab in. But again, it's, it's going to be a running back by committee. DMC is probably a better pass catcher, as is Rod Smith, right? There's two better pass catchers on Dallas as opposed to Morris. Uh, but they will get plenty of scoring opportunities. It's a good offense, so there should be a lot of carries to go around. 
Um, you know, Al Alfred Morris is going to get the first crack. I doubt he'll be on a long leash here. So it's possible that if he doesn't start off hot, that DMC could take that role. So you're definitely, you definitely need to own, you know, both backs need to be owned in all leagues, right? 10 teams, 12 teams, PPR, standard, whatever it is. They both need to be owned. Rod Smith, uh, I definitely don't think needs to be owned. I think people are going to get real kind of cute here and they're going to be like, oh, Rod Smith is really, really good. Like, no, he's not. Shut your mouth. He doesn't need to be owned outside of uh, teams that are super, super desperate and need a flyer or running back. And uh, definitely not in 10-team leagues. You don't need to own him. I would say 12-team is where you probably start looking at him if, if you need a running back that you know has some upside here. But overall, again, Morris is my top guy. Uh, there's no reason that all these reports would be coming out from all the personnel and coaching on the team if they were just suddenly going to give DMC the ball 18, 20 times a game. So... Morris can easily, you know, stick with a 4.5, 5 yards per carry. And if they're going to give him 15 carries, he could definitely put up um, good numbers in standard leagues because there will be scoring opportunities, right? Zeke's been on fire, scoring tons of rushing touchdowns as of late. Um, so, I don't know. That's kind of my take. And anyone who thinks they know about the Dallas Cowboys backfield situation is a fool. They need to be put into purgatory. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Um, and then I just want to do a little section at the end. Other players we're hearing trade rumors about. Firstly, I heard uh, Frank Gore. And I, I, frankly, no pun intended, I'd be very shocked if they actually moved Gore. Because it, it's clear to see that they don't trust Mac as like the every down back. It's a million dollar rhyme right there. And uh, and I don't think they just let go of Gore, especially after losing Turbin and, and hand the keys off to Mac. What I would say, I was thinking about some teams, right? It has to be a team that's a contender. It has to be a team that doesn't have a good running game because obviously you're not going to trade for a 34-year-old back with no future in the NFL. Thinking Washington, right? Kelly's keep getting banged up. P. Ryan sucks. Oakland. Lynch has been playing poorly, but I, I kind of think they're kind of redundant next to each other. Maybe Carolina. I think it'd be a, an upgrade over Stewart. But again, I, I'd be surprised if Frank Gore moved. Jarvis Landry is an interesting one. Uh, New England, Seattle, Atlanta, New York Giants. What I think, I've been tweeting about it all morning. Odell Beckham tweeted out like some shit, like yelling about Jarvis Landry, bring him to the Giants. I think, if you didn't know this, like if you don't follow OBJ or anything on Instagram, OBJ and Jarvis Landry, they both went to LSU. They are, they are boys. They are motherfudging boys, right? If the Giants can take Jarvis Landry, I think it is a huge bargaining gambling piece in re-signing Odell Beckham Jr. Odell Beckham will not leave if Jarvis Landry's on the Giants. I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that. You can come back to my channel if it happens and, and fight me on it if you'd like. Uh, I'm not sure it makes sense in a personnel kind of move because Sterling Shepard's a slot guy. They have, they have Ingram kind of running tight end over the middle and stuff. Interesting to see how it works out, but he's been rumored. Vontae Davis has been rumored as a trade target. All these Colts basically. Vontae Davis, I know he's been elite at points in his career for a small time, but he's he's currently graded as a 98th graded cornerback per pro football focus out of 114. I mean, the chain, change of scenery has done him wonders once. I don't know if it could happen again. Uh, well, you know, we'll just have to wait on that. Martavis Bryant, all the craziness in Pittsburgh. The, the reports are saying he's already in the game plan for week 10, so I guess he's not going to be moved. Definitely still behind Juju Smith-Schuster. Dante Moncrief, also rumors. Maybe Washington, they're looking for a big play guy. Same with T.Y. Hilton. I think they'd have to give up, a team would have to give up a ton of, a ton of uh, draft capital to get T.Y. Hilton. DeMarco Murray, that would be interesting, right? Let Derrick Henry take over that workhorse role. I wonder if it's Jerry Jones trying to shop for DeMarco Murray. Could we see a possible reunion in Dallas? And lastly, we, I just, just saw a report of Josh Gordon. He's in New York City meeting with an NFL rep supposedly today um, for reinstatement purposes. Adam Schefter tweeted, you know, the Browns could trade the rights to Josh Gordon before the 4 p.m. deadline. Who knows? I'm not touching Josh Gordon. I know some people will ask that question. I, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm staying away from Gordon. And that kind of wraps up the madness that we've had so far. Right now it is 2.15 p.m. So we don't know exactly uh, what more is to come in the next hour and 45 minutes. Again, if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, please go do that on the site. Also, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. If you like the breakdown, whatever, 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 I don't really care. Go follow your boy on Twitter. Go follow me on Instagram. All that stuff is linked below, and I'll see y'all on Thursday for my weekly video, as always. Peace. Peace.